Ladies and gentlemen, I would like at the outset to express my great pleasure at having been given the opportunity to be associated with the 1967 Sardar Vallabhai Patel Memorial Lectures. I am grateful to the Director General of All India Radio. This annual program of lectures commemorate the memory of a distinguished Indian statesman administrator, the late Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Instituted in 1955, the inaugural lecture was delivered by Sri Chakravarti Rajagvalachari, another eminent Indian and a colleague of the Sardar, happily still with us. Dr. Jacob Chande has been invited to deliver the 1967 Sardar Patel Memorial Lecture. Dr. Chande started his medical studies at the Madras Medical College. After working for a period in Arabia, he proceeded to Pennsylvania in the United States where he took his master's science degree. He then went over to Montreal, the mecca of neurology and neurosurgery of those days, and worked under Dr. Wilder Penfield, a household name in neurosurgery. Dr. Chandy took his FRCS of Canada in 1947, and after a period of further training, he returned to India. In India, he undertook the organization of the first neurosurgical center at the Christian Medical College, Velo. The progress of this center to international recognition has been due to Dr. Chandi's professional excellence and single-minded devotion. Honors have come to him from many quarters, including international professional bodies. In 1964, the government of India awarded the Padma Bhushan for his services to the country. The choice of the subject of this year's lecture is appropriate and timely. In most of the developed countries, there is a rethinking of the relation between the medical profession in general and the physician in particular and society. Changes are taking place rapidly and it's likely that in the foreseeable future, the relation between the physician and society as it existed in the late 50s may have completely changed. We in the developing countries cannot escape this change and this change inevitably will create problems. Dr. Chandi, who has had two decades of experience as a senior physician in one of the best known medical institutions in this country, and who has also had, in the latter part, administrative experience as uh, the head of that institution, and who has had intimate contact with all strata of society in this country, is very well fitted to give answers to some of these problems. May I now request Dr. Chandi to give the 1967 Sardar Patel Memorial Lecture. Colonel Iyer, ladies and gentlemen, I am indeed greatly honored by giving me this opportunity to deliver the Sardar Patel Memorial Lectures for 1967. May I express my grateful thanks to the organizers. Our country is passing through a very crucial period in its history. We are in the midst of many crossroads. The country is facing great turmoils due to industrial revolution, economic strains, political and ideological upheavals, and even the effects of disruption of the sociological order. More than anything else, we are facing a tremendous population explosion. The gap between the increasing birth rate and decreasing death rate is widening. This becomes all the more evident when we realize that 40% of our present population is below the age of 15. This is all India Radio Obviously, the birth rate will increase much more rapidly in the future, and the advancement in health services will further decrease the death rate. The average life expectancy in India, which was 28 years in 1950, is now about 48 or 50. The one profession which is very closely involved more than any other in the total well-being of the people and the society is the medical profession and obviously the physician has a very vital role to play. Therefore, I thought it appropriate to choose for these lectures the main theme 
the physician and the society. This subject is discussed as the making of the physician, the role of the physician, and the science and the physician. Today, I am talking on the making of the physician of today. After immobile conservatism had persisted so long that any other mode of life was beyond conception, the structure of human society began to alter about 200 years ago with the coming of the Industrial Revolution. Progress in every facet of human endeavor has been incredible since this time. Before this period, superstition and conservatism persisted for many centuries. Feudalism, which was the order of the day, decreed that the poor and uneducated, who formed the majority of the population, remained so forever. The wealthy and educated, though a minority, were the powerful force. The basic nature of human life, the forms and patterns of living, the intrinsic nature of ideas, beliefs and motives, and the organization and struggles of the society altered very little in spite of sporadic advancements at various periods in various countries. Civilization developed and declined. Man adjusted to himself to his environment. The complex contemporary situation was reached because of the activities of the scientists, not only in making new discoveries, but also in helping mankind to apply such discoveries to daily living. The occurrence of such men of science at this time is probably because the intellectual climate for the Renaissance was favorable to the exploration of literary and artistic possibilities of human activities, and also for the investigation of natural phenomena. From the beginning, man had a great concern for the maintenance of health. For the natural phenomena of the survival of the fittest predominated, and the only way a man could survive was through good health and good physique. In those times, the few physicians who had the scientific approach tried to eliminate superstition and degenerating habits of life. Among them can be counted Shushrita, Charaka, and Hippocrates. The Hippocratic tradition remained a living force in Western medicine till about two centuries ago. Surprising as it may seem, the treatises on air, waters, and places was reprinted for medical schools as late as 1874. Later, physicians recognized that the Hippocratic writings were not directly applicable to the clinical problems of their time, and they went to Hippocrates for general medical wisdom than for practical information. He had emphasized that the role of the external environment on the characteristic of man in health and disease shall not be lost sight of. It was only his wisdom that gave relevance to environmental forces, to the problem of human biology, medicine, and sociology. The intellectual basis of Hippocratic medicine had to be limited to the belief that many important physiological and behavioral characteristics of man are conditioned to a large extent by the environment a man is born and brought up. During the last couple of centuries, two scientific components made Hippocratic medicine obsolete, namely the doctrine of specific etiology of disease and the description of the organism in terms of cellular structure and their physiological mechanism. In other words, the introduction of molecular biology in the understanding of medicine. Thus, the complexity of the situation progressively increased. 
the social psychologist or the philosopher cannot simply ignore the perplexing factors that have arisen to complicate the problem. Environment and man in his environment was one of the main themes of European culture during the later half of the last <coughs> century. The environment was blamed for all social, ethical, cultural, and even medical problems. Lamarck and Darwin, each in his own way, regarded organic evolution as the outcome of the interplay between living organisms and their environment. Claude Bertrand formulated the view that disease was the faulty attempt of the organism to adapt to environmental insults, and Warshaw postulated that disease was life under changed conditions. Social reforms came into being because of the belief that most disease problems originated from environmental conditions created by poverty and filth, and therefore could be solved by improving living conditions. During the last century, the crusade against poverty, malnutrition, and filth received scientific support from the study of specific etiology of diseases and biological changes in cellular structure under conditions of malnutrition and disease. Thus, experimental science gave support to the campaign against environmental agents of disease. The specific effect of drugs and change of environmental conditions produced a dramatic fall in the mortality rate all over the Western world. The efficacy of this approach against infections and nutritional diseases dominated the medical picture. The environmental factors still remain a force to be contented with in underdeveloped and developing countries. Around the turn of this century, the focus of medical interest shifted from the environment to the intimate structures and mechanisms of living organisms. This shift occurred simultaneously in the various fields of general biology and medicine. Darwinian approach to evolution was replaced by studies focusing on chromosomes, later on genes, and finally on molecular genetics. The interest of experimental medicine developed from infections to immunological processes and cellular metabolism, and in nutrition, emphasis shifted from the quantity to its quality. Similarly, even environmental determinants of Pavlovian or conditioned reflexes and Freudian complexes are being replaced by the detailed analysis of neuronal mechanisms and memory storage and retrieval processes. The brilliant success of 20th century medicine has been through the study of intimate mechanisms of physiology and metabolism of the tissues of the body. Technological advances have made it possible for these advances. All medical problems present themselves under two aspects which are sharply different but also complementary to one another. On the one hand, all phenomena of health and disease reflect the biological unity of mankind. On the other, all health and disease problems are conditioned by the diversity of social and environmental conditions and ways of life. The duality of man's nature, unity and diversity creates a medical paradox that all men, irrespective of origin, have fundamentally the same biological constitution, physiological requirements, and same response to any stimuli. Yet, despite this biological uniformity, the diseases and medicines differ profoundly in accordance with habits, social and economic conditions, climatic variations, 
and ways of life. Thus it becomes important that those concerned with the problems of health and disease must therefore keep in mind both the universal aspects of human biology and socio-economic and environmental diversities of medical problems. The human environment and ways of life are endlessly changing at different rates and in different ways in different parts of the world. Man feels threatened by the constant, unavoidable exposure to stimuli of urban and industrial civilization. Impact of technological advancement, physiological disturbances, emotional trauma, disruption of set patterns of community and society are influencing most of the medical problems. To a very large extent, the disorders of the body and mind are but an expression of the inadequate responses to the changing conditions. A comprehensive understanding of the environmental and technological influences are necessary for the physicians to deal effectively with the problems he confronts. To the physician, it would seem that he would need only to synthesize the existing humanistic and scientific knowledge to deal with the health problems of man. Yet, the importance of personal influences on the individual and the community cannot be overlooked. To find the place of the physician in modern society, it is important to recognize the situation of the present generation in the world today. It is a world of shocking paradox, and as in the words of the late Secretary General of UN, Doug Hamshaw, there were, on the one hand, those to whom good health was customary and for whom adequate facilities existed to provide attendance in disease, who could expect a lifespan of 65 or 70 years, who had opportunity for education and for attaining the magic power that goes with knowledge of the written word, who would economically well established and to whom hunger was seldom known, who enjoyed political liberty and reasonable hope of justice under law. There was, on the other hand, that much larger element of human race whose members suffered chronically from diseases and who would seldom expect to live beyond 30 years or 35, who were illiterate and denied the other tools and values of education, to whom hunger, inadequate housing and other economic and social ills were the commonplace of life and who in many cases were deprived of national independence and often of individual liberty and consistent justice. Of over half the people in the world, it would be said to adapt the words of Thomas Hobbes that their lives would almost inevitably be poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Of course, it is true that the conditions of this kind were not new. What is new is that, for the first time, the majority of the people of the world have become convinced that the continuation of such a condition is not necessary. The people of the world do not believe that the role of nature or the law of God is that they would be born in misery and hasten to an early grave. Now, everyone everywhere knows that it is possible to enjoy material comforts and enjoy a reasonable measure of positive health if there can be adequate socio-economic development, education, and health services. Men and women everywhere want freedom, but they also want sufficient food, homes, health, and work. 
National independence is obviously not enough. Inequalities in the distribution of comforts and privileges still remain. The gap between the developed and underdeveloped areas in the world in its economic and social structure is still increasing. The disparity is evident among communities or societies even within a country. It is noted that in some of the poorer countries, the standard of living continues to deteriorate rather than improve. The great tragedy of contemporary life is the fact that a large part of the humanity, men, women and children, are living in fear, hunger and disease. The fundamental issue of the world today is to find means to educate and to bring positive health to the majority of the peoples of the world. Perhaps the most important single advancement in our social behavior is summarized in often quoted words of Arnold Toynbee when he said, our age will be remembered not for its horrifying crimes or its astonishing inventions, but because it is the first age since the dawn of history in which mankind dared to believe it practicable to make the benefits of civilization available to the whole human race. To have brought about an almost universal acceptance of this philosophy, the responsibility to make available to the whole human race the benefits of civilization is the most remarkable achievement in the history of man. The part that the physicians have to play in the community in bringing about this state of affairs places the physician even today in a peculiarly important place. Perhaps it is because he is dealing with the life and death of the individual or because his help is needed at an emotionally charged situation that he has been always considered inestimable in all societies from the beginning of time. From the earliest writings from many parts of the world, there are evidences that there existed physicians who practiced the art of healing in one form or another. In the ancient civilization of Egypt, Babylonia, Mexico and Peru, the practice of medicine was by priests. It was a curious blend of superstition, empirism and observation. In other countries also, the indulgence of the practice of medicine was mixed up with religion and tradition. Even today, in the underdeveloped and developing countries, there are systems of medicine where tradition, empirism, observation is the basis of treatment. Such practice of medicine, which involved in the oriental civilizations of the river valleys of India and China, have survived to the present day in spite of the development of the scientific approach to medicine. In the recorded history of India, during the post-Vedic period, that is 600 BC to 200 AD, physicians were trained in the universities of Taxila and Nalanda, and they were given the titles of Prana Acharya and Prana Vishadha. It is reported that Kasi became a great center for surgery. The names of Shushrata and Charaka were associated with surgery and medicine respectively in the classical writings. Their expositions are still taught in the Indian system of medicine. A medical oath similar to the Hippocratic oath binding the student with rules of personal hygiene, prevention of transmission of infection and contamination to others, moral behavior and obligation to the teacher and the patients of both sexes was present. A number of hospitals were established in India by the son of Buddha for men and women. 
This was further developed by King Ashoka in later years throughout his kingdom. The universities of Taxila, Nalanda, and Kasi declined with the changing political conditions. So, formal training of students in medicine gradually disappeared, and in its place throughout the country, various physicians took students for training. A similar system, the Unani system of medicine, was introduced by the Muslim invasion. Western system of medicine, along scientific lines, was introduced by the British. The Western system of medicine started with the analytical approach advocated by Hippocrates and his followers. Greek and Roman medical literature gives detailed information of how physicians were trained after they had religious and other general education in the residential institutions set up for such a training. In medieval times, a well-developed school of medicine came into being in Salerno by the fusion of the cultures of Greek, Latin, Jew, and Arab. They dissected and studied the animals in preparation to know human anatomy, thus evolving a scientific method. During the 12th century, medical schools were started in France, Spain, Portugal, and England by the students from Salerno. And it is interesting that these schools were closely associated with theology and the clergy. At that time, the only scholars were the clergy. Even the name hospital is a Latin word, hospitium, which means a house or institution for guests. Early in the Christian era, hospitals were established for the sick or weary travelers, and for the poor, the blind, and the crippled. Soon other universities where medicine was taught started in Bologna in 1113, Oxford in 1167, and Padua in 1222. Their schools of medicine were basically a repetition of Greek medicine following the Hippocratic traditions and philosophy. Two outstanding men of that period exerted considerable influence in training physicians' minds towards scientific approach. Bacon stressed the importance of acquiring knowledge through scientific study and research. The government in England, for the first time, realized that every physician must have a certain qualification to practice medicine, and a system of licensure was established in the 16th century. Physicians had to pass an examination to acquire the license to practice. Organized teaching of medicine became the order of the day, not only in England, but in many of the European countries where already seeds of learning in medicine had been well established. As knowledge in medical science advanced, it replaced the practice of medicine as educated by Hippocrates and his school. Thus, the beginning of the scientific or modern medical practice and training. In 1800, Dr. Charles Newman, expressing his ideas on the aims of medical education in England wrote, medical education is to produce a cultured and a highly educated gentleman with quite secondarily an adequate knowledge of medicine. In other words, general education was considered essential even before acquiring skills in dealing with the health problems. The General Medical Council of Great Britain was established by an act only in 1858 with the following functions. Supervision and regulation of the standard of professional knowledge expected of medical students before qualification. And two, registration of qualified medical men. And three, publication of British pharmacopoeia. 
the responsibility for producing a safe general medical practitioner rested with the general medical council from this time onwards in various parts of the world medical education advanced reforms were affected through reports and recommendations of special committees commissions private educational organizations and departments of governments the world health organization was established after the second world war the committee of the section on professional and technical education in medicine met and defined some of the fundamental concepts in medical education in relation to society they also reviewed the functions of the medical teaching institutions the educational requirements of medical students and a detailed curriculum of professional education this enumerated in detail the relationship of basic and clinical science of medicine and the necessity for supervised experience after completion of formal course and before registration to practice the committee also recommended national and international collaboration with a view to promote improved standards of medical education it stressed not only the importance of curative medicine but also its preventive aspects emphasizing the community as a whole the world health organization has various regional offices and india is included in the southeast asia region the training of men for the health needs of the countries have become an international concern and the first world medical educational conference was held in london in 1953 the second in chicago in 1959 and the third in new delhi in 1966 even though the first medical school was started in 1832 in calcutta university medical education started in india only in 1835 with the establishment of medical colleges affiliated to universities in madras calcutta and bombay the general supervision of medical education in india till 1933 was under the general medical council of the united kingdom the medical council of india was instituted in 1933 with reciprocal recognition just as the general medical council in the united kingdom the medical council of india has the responsibility to maintain uniform minimum standards of medical education and through its provincial councils exercises authority for the registration to practice the responsibility for meeting the health needs of the country lies with the state governments however the central government helps to develop health care and medical education for this purpose specific committees known as bor committee in 1944 and mudalia committee in 1959 and several other medical educational conferences were set up by the government of india for the development of health education and health services in the country until 1946 there were only 15 medical colleges in the country with an annual enrollment of 1200 students today there are 92 medical colleges with over 12000 annual admissions of the 70 universities in india 37 universities have medical faculties even though medical education is within the responsibilities of the universities with supervisory control of the medical council of india it is not enjoying the support and encouragement from the education aspect from that ministry nor is it adequately strengthened by all other faculties of any particular university all subjects in medical education has direct relationship with other faculties in the universities all branches of biological and physical sciences even subjects such as sociology anthropology and psychology have much association with the study of human biology 
All technological advances in medicine have been due to the developments in closely related fields of scientific activity. In fact, all scientific advances in medicine have been due to its close collaboration with other scientific disciplines. Medical science or education, medical education cannot remain isolated from other areas. Thus it is important that the study of medicine should be considered along with other subjects in the field of higher education. It is stated by Professor Kothari and urged by the Education Commission of 1966 that the basic role of higher education in our country should be to promote a sense of common citizenship and culture and to further national integration to make a direct contribution to national productivity and to contribute in however modest measure to the world stock of rapidly expanding knowledge and technology. Obviously, the universities can make an important contribution towards the attainment of this goal. Medical education has peculiar opportunities. The product of the medical education, the physician, plays a vital role in the lives of people and society. For financial support in the development of universities, our revered leader, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, brought into effect the University Grants Commission, and he observed the purpose of having a high-powered University Grants Commission is to make them responsible for the division of money available for the purpose among universities concerned, which means of universities in India, including the central universities. For this purpose, the commission should practically be autonomous. So far as this division of grants to universities is concerned, this is the special work of the commission, and they are the best qualified to judge. Even the cabinet is not in a better position to judge this because they cannot keep an intimate touch with the universities and their work. It is for the government to determine the total amount to be placed at the disposal of the commission for grants in aid to the universities. Quotation ends. Even though medical education is so vital to the national development, the University Grants Commission is outside the purview of such an important faculty of the universities. I am sure much benefit can be got if the University Grants Commission can also directly involve itself in furthering the progress in medical education in our country. According to the present estimate, in India there is only one physician for every 5,800 people, whereas it is stated that in developed countries there is one physician for every 500 to 600 population. We have to keep in mind the problem of rapidly increasing population, low socioeconomic levels, 65 to 30 percent of illiteracy in our country, and that 80 percent of our population live in rural areas when we consider increasing the number of physicians to meet the needs of the country. Even though 80% of the population in the country lives in rural areas, only about 20% of the medical manpower have shown willingness to go to these areas. 80% of the medical men is in the urban areas. One has to consider the question of developing rural areas socioeconomically to absorb medical men for these areas. Even if the government is able to finance medical relief in rural areas, medical men hesitate to go to the villages for want of adequate living conditions. Every state has varying number of medical colleges with attached teaching hospitals. Besides the teaching hospitals, there are big and small hospitals in the urban areas and few small hospitals scattered in better developed villages. During the last 20 years, primary health centers have been opened in the rural areas. 
Each primary health center with one or occasionally two physicians have to take care of 60 to 100,000 population. It is difficult to get medical men for some of these centers. It is estimated that only 60% of the existing places have been filled in. To meet the total health needs of the country, obviously many more health centers have to be opened, which will need many more physicians. The tendency of the new graduates in medicine is to congregate to the urban areas. Obviously, there are many reasons for their choice. Yet it is important that this group of scientifically trained men should choose villages. How can this be done? To make the young physician to turn away from a lucrative urban practice with all the amenities of life that exist there and to choose a difficult and tiresome responsibility is the concern of the medical educators and leaders of the nation. While they are in training, they have to acquire a sense of dedication, commitment, and devotion to service. This is the problem facing our country today. The only answer is that the teachers themselves have to have this concern and commitment. There will have to be a change in motivation, both among the teachers and the taught. Yet without providing adequate facilities and amenities in the rural areas, even the best motivated individual may not be able to fulfill this task. I have mentioned much about the emergence of modern scientifically oriented physician from the earlier traditional one based on experience and observation. But what exactly is the situation of our 515 million people facing today? Our land is full of paradox. Traditional indigenous medicine still thrives. Even this system of medicine is not available to the masses in the villages. Yet we have highly sophisticated specialists in every branch of medicine and surgery with all technological advances. Millions of people cannot get enough to eat and disease due to malnutrition are very, very common. Most people in our country cannot get protected water supply, and even the basic necessities of life are lacking for the majority of the population. Even though we have progressed somewhat to meet the health needs of the country, yet very much more has to be done. The physician of today is in a dilemma. His desires for personal achievements and comforts drag him to sophisticated medical practice in cities and towns, but his dedication, commitment to service and devotion pulls him to the poor and the needy. Where can he go? The majority of medical educational institutions have been developed only in recent years and are lacking in necessary facilities, equipments, and qualified and experienced teachers. Therefore, there is only mediocrity in medical education and consequently, it is a fact that most of the young physicians of India today have not had the proper training. It is essential to strive for better standards, but it is not possible to raise the standard of uniformly in all medical colleges when there are so much lacking in those institutions. So it becomes imperative that at least few selected institutions must maintain and keep up the quality of teaching and training, so that they can be not only leaders in the field of excellent medical service, but also be teachers and research workers for medical colleges in the country. It is essential that such institutions must also participate in clinical medical research to solve much of the local problems that the physicians are facing in our country. For this purpose, the Government of India is establishing postgraduate institutions. The onward march of medical education and research must continue, and every future physician must be better than the ones who have served before. Thank you.